everyone. Thanks for joining me for the Founders and Startups podcast. This is Lisa Connors Vote. I'm an executive and leadership coach, and you can learn more about me on my website at everbetteryou.com. My guest today has a very different type of business from other founders who've been on the podcast. I'm here with Barbie the Welder. She's an artist who creates amazing metal sculptures and inspires others to follow their dreams and honor their calling. Hey there, Barbie. How's it going? Good. I'm so excited to have you on the show today and learn more about your journey. I'm a big fan. And um, let's just start with your business, the business of Barbie the Welder. Describe that for me. So today my business is mainly I am a full-time metal sculptor. I design and create sculptures for exclusive clients all over the world including major corporations, uh, individuals, and uh, contractors. I uh, have people get a hold of me. They contact me through either social media or email, and they ask if I would design and create them a sculpture. Uh, I'm at the point today where I can say yes or no, depending on if I like it, which is just a beautiful place to be as an artist. It's wonderful. Uh, I also teach uh, people how to weld art through books I've written and through my YouTube channel. So much going on in that studio. That's fantastic. Well, congratulations on getting to the point where you can sort of pick and choose the work that you're doing. Um, can I ask you, okay, so for people who are listening to this on audio, you should also know that you can go to the YouTube channel for founders and startups and look at the video. And behind Barbie is a really cool view of, there's lots of stuff going on behind us actually. What is that? What is that? What are you creating? Oh. This is going to be to date um, my most amazing masterpiece. I've created several masterpiece sculptures, um, but this one here is pushing me to a whole nother level. This is a uh, half woman and half phoenix. And I don't know if you can see, like instead of having legs, she has, um, these are gonna be like the tail feathers of a phoenix. And then she's gonna have the body of a woman, her arms are gonna be out and she's gonna have giant wings. All said and done, nine and a half foot wide, six foot tall, I would go taller, but my garage door uh, only goes six foot tall. Amazing. And how long is it going to take you to create the whole sculpture from beginning to end? That's a good question. Um, this is my design. Uh, if I get a chance, I like I have, I have like ideas for like years. <laughs> And so yeah. <laughs> if I get a chance in between custom work, I get to create what I want. Um, I started her, I think, three or four months ago, but I have not been able to work on her consistently because of the amount of work that I have in. Um, it's, hard, it's hard to tell when I get into stuff like this because I can spend a 16-hour day in here and then not, you know, not be able to work on her for a while. So my goal, my goal was to have her done by the end of March. We'll see how it goes. Stay okay. <laughs> and so are you doing that for a specific client? Or are you doing that because it's something that you wanted to create? This one's me. Um, this one is one that I have, um, I absolutely relate to the Phoenix. Um, welding has risen me from the ashes. Is that the right way to say that? Welding mm -hmm. has helped me rise from the ashes. Uh, my life was literally in ashes when I found welding sculpture. Um, I tend to be able to, I can sculpt how I feel much better than I can explain it verbally. And so mm. this is really, it's a self portrait. If that's, I don't even know if it's a portrait in metal. I have no training in art. Um, I'm completely self-taught as an artist. And so like, there's a lot of stuff I have no freaking clue. Like, I don't know if it's a self portrait, if it's in metal, but versus like a painting. Um, but this is me, this is me in metal form and just the whole, the whole rising from the ashes. I think it's a self-portrait in metal, absolutely. And yeah, yeah, we're all learning as we go along, so that's wonderful. And that's part of what inspires you. You know, what that's part of the inspiration that you bring to other people too, is that you share this journey on YouTube, on LinkedIn, other social media, about you learning as you go along. And so I'd love to hear that story, but I just wanna ask you about this sculpture. When you're done, is that something that you're gonna sell or are you going to keep it for yourself? She will be available to purchase when I'm done. Um, it makes my heart beat hard just even thinking about it. Like it's, it's the hardest thing as an artist is 
I create things that I'm madly in love with. But in order to continue to push myself as an artist and as just a human being to better myself, I have to be able to afford to live. So I have to sell it in order to be able to create something else and, you know, just live on a day to day basis. So it's a very masochistic profession I found. <laughs> but uh, I, I just, I'm obsessed. I'm absolutely obsessed with the metal and with creating and just pushing myself. So yes, she is going to have to be sold when I'm done. Like I will laugh and cry. Like it'll be. It'll be a very glorious moment when someone finally does like love her as much as I do and want to take her home. But it's like, it's that happy. Um, it's like a double edged sword. You know, it's, it's happy and sad at the same time. Mm -hmm. I have another piece. It's, um, it was my very first masterpiece. And I'm very blessed that it's five minutes from my house. Oh, nice. The person who commissioned it literally, um, their business is about five, five or six minutes down the road. And I do go visit her often. <laughs> Oh, and I love that you call your sculptures her. Yeah. Um, it's, it's very, uh, I'm a parent. I've got two kids. It's very similar to being a parent. Mm. Um, you, you raise them, you, you know, you shape them, you sculpt them into, you know, who you hope that they'll be. You hope that they'll grow up and, you know, just be beautiful human beings. And I feel like being a sculptor is very similar to being a parent is that you, you know, you shape it and sculpt it and you hope that it grows up to be beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> you hope it grows up to, to add value to the world, you know, it's like you hope your kids do. That's right. At some point you have to put them out into the world and say, please inspire yeah. others, go do your thing. Hopefully you did a good job. I'm sure you're, I'm sure you're doing a great job with your kids and you definitely are with your sculpture. Um, so, let me ask you about who you're selling your art to and who your customers are. Can you share with us some of the customers that you've worked with in the past year or so? Uh, this is mind blowing. I have goosebumps. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's mind blowing. Um, I have created two sculptures for Harley Davidson. Wow. Um, I have created sculptures for Weiler Abrasives. Uh, I've created, um, I just finished masterpiece sculptures for my hometown, Elmira, New York. Yay. Um, I have created sculptures for Carolina Shoe Company. Um, oh, Chicago Pneumatic, a very recent one is Chicago Pneumatic. Um, incredible. I just created sculptures on location for um, um, Southwestern Scale in Phoenix, Arizona, where I traveled there and actually worked in their shop and created live. Um, like right in their in their fabrication shop so just amazing uh amazing prime um prime compliance solutions is another one mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. yeah just just incredible uh just inc like it, it's really like it's really hard to it's surreal i know that word in artistry yeah it's real where my art has taken me like you, you wouldn't have imagined that you would be creating for Harley Davidson and these other companies no, not a few years ago. Years. Not in a million years. If you would have told me five years ago, five and a half years ago, when I quit my job, um, the companies that would have wanted to work with me, I'd have called you a liar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you share what? It's really just. <laughs> Yeah, well, and I applaud you. It's amazing, you know. And and this is, you know, this is why you belong on this podcast with founders and startups. You know, I ha I'm trying to have a diverse set of people who run businesses, and uh, you know, to showcase how you started. Well, you're going to tell us how you started very small scale, and then how you've grown today. It's super inspiring. Can you share the price range of your products? Are you comfortable sharing that? Absolutely. Um, anywhere from like. Today, anywhere from about two thousand dollars up to she's gonna be four hundred and fifty thousand dollars when I'm done. Awesome, that's fantastic. <laughs> okay, or the highest bidder. Yeah, how does you got it? Let's start a bidding war. All right, how does someone get in touch with you if they want to bid on that? Uh, BarbieTheWelder.com is my website, and BarbieTheWelder at Yahoo.com is my email. So whether it's through my website or my email and a lot of people contact me through my social media and I keep it real simple for myself to remember it's Barbara the Welder, whether you're on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and I'm very, very new to TikTok. I'm having fun with TikTok because there's some really great videos on there. Addicted. 
Um, and over on YouTube as well. My YouTube channel is also Barbie the Welder. Okay, nice. I know you do have thousands. You have like almost 17,000 people um, subscribed to your YouTube channel. Yes. Yeah. Pretty astounding. That's awesome. 50, 51 different countries are represented in those. Uh, I know. 51 different countries. I don't know if I can name 10. I flunked out of geometry. Geography. geography. <laughs> I was good in geometry. <laughs> and geography. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, let's go back to, let's go to the beginning. Um, so you're from Elmira, New York. That's what you just said. You're from Elmira, New York. Born and raised in Elmira, New York. Okay, and I'm from Rochester, New York. So same state, a oh, little bit of a awesome. different region. Yeah. I'm in Rochester Saturday. I was just there this Saturday. I love Rochester. Oh, good. What do you... Ah, okay. Okay. Well, we can talk about that. <laughs> we can talk about that more afterwards. Um, and so you were born in Elmira, New York, and you're still living in the same area? Same area. I'm in Erin, New York, E-R-I-N. It's a very small town, uh, 10 minutes east of Horseheads, about 15 whole minutes from my, uh, my hometown. <laughs> okay, good, good. And you know what? Are you near Corning, New York? Yes. Yep, about 20, 22 minutes to Corning from me. Okay, so, and I think that the Corning Glass Museum is this really amazing place. And you can go, like, if you're watching the video, there's a little black pumpkin on my shelf in the back where I went and I um, picked oh, out the colors and I was there when they, they, you know, blew the glass and I sort of helped make a pumpkin um, last October, which was really fun. But that's an amazing place. Do you think that growing up in the shadow of the Corning Art Museum had any influence on you artistically? It did not. Um, with all due respect, and I go to Corning Glass now for inspiration, even though glass is totally different animal. Yeah, um, I'm deeply inspired by the artists that have pieces there. Um, but yeah, art was never anything that I was good at or interested in. I wanted mm. to be an auto mechanic when I was little, um, well, when I was about 15. But as a kid, I wanted to be the first female on the Harlem Globetrotters. And I also wanted to be the first kid on the moon. Art had nothing to do with anything I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, so how did you become a welder? Uh, I became a welder to be an artist. That was the entire purpose of it. Um, I have a background in auto mechanics. Out of high school, I was an auto mechanic. Uh, went to BOCES for it. Went to college for it. Worked in the industry uh, between school and working about seven years. Dealt with sexism throughout the entire thing. Was absolutely miserable after a while and got out and went to work for myself. Um, there was a bunch of odd jobs in there. I delivered pizzas. I'm good at driving. I like to wheel cars. Um, the last job that I held, um, I was actually pulling parts off of cars at a local place called Salvage Yard called Pick Apart. And I was selling them on eBay and I was also uh, shopping at like the dollar store, TJ Maxx and Walmart. And I was buying stuff there and actually selling that stuff for a profit on eBay. People are a lot better consumers today. That wouldn't Wow. <laughs> Nice. But I was actually, um, I was supporting, I was supporting my family with that. And I say that because I was making about $10,000 a year uh, for a family of five. Okay. And at wow. the time with myself, my husband, his daughter, my son, and a son that we had together. Um, uh, I was also hauling scrap metal and he wasn't working. He did work, he did work in haul scrap metal for a while, but really was not a worker, was not raised to be a worker. And just, I don't think he was, I don't know, that's not right to say, but just, he was not cut out to be a dad and husband. Was just wasn't his area of expertise. Okay. Um, and so he just, he wasn't helping provide for the family. Mm -hmm. So we were struggling deeply. Um, at that time, I found welding by seeing the movie Castaway starring Tom Hanks. In the beginning of the movie, there's this woman that is welding these giant angel wings. Um, and it spoke to my soul. That 15 second clip has shaped the last 13 years of my life. Um, I knew it was what I was meant to be. I can't explain why or how or anything else. I have zero experience in art. My, my um, stick figures are like questionable. Um, just really, you know, I, I worked with my hands with my dad growing up. And there was never, like, my dad, like, if my dad was, like, doing drywall, then I was doing drywall. If he's doing electrical, I was doing electrical. He, like, took me everywhere right. from 
And so I just, I was hands-on like all my life. That's why I suffered in school is because I just didn't learn by opening a book. Okay. Um, but I saw that woman doing those, that, that sculpture. And I'm just like, that's what I was meant to do. So, you know what? I just want to stop that. you for a second. Cause I remember that scene. I, I remember that so well. And I have noticed that there are wings that appear in your sculptures a lot. And is that because of this original inspiration? I think between that, but I think really the reason the wings spoke to me is because I've always loved to fly. Um, I grew up with my dad was actually um, a pilot, uh, personal or not. Pri he didn't fly anyone else around. Him and his buddies like got together and they bought a plane together and they all just got their license and learned how to fly. So I grew up as a little kid flying. Um, I had oh, wow. dreams about flying, like, but without a plane, like me flying, I've just always been attracted to flying. And so like the wings just totally speak to me. And I think that's probably why that that moment hit me so hard. If she was welding a car, which I love cars, like I love cars. If she was welding, you know, something else, it probably wouldn't hit me as hard as it would have mm -hmm. because of the fact that those are wings. But yeah, I mean, like she's going to get... She's going to have about a nine and a half foot wingspan, 10 foot wingspan ish, as wide as I can get it and still get her out of the garage door. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you measured that in advance. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> There's a reason for that, and I'll explain that one later. <laughs> okay. There's some trial and error there. <laughs> there is yeah. trial and error. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so you saw that movie, you were inspired. Uh, so at one point you were, you were just working multiple jobs, doing anything you could to generate money to support your family. Um, and then at what point did you start welding? Um, when I saw that movie, I decided that I was going to be a sculptor. I knew from that moment, um, I figured the first thing I needed to do was to learn how to weld. And then once I learned how to weld, I can figure out the rest. I guess I really am not the kind of person that really plans too much. I'm like, it's time to do this. Um, I explained to my family that that's what I wanted to do. And they all thought I was that crap crazy. Um, we didn't have enough money. Like we were already on welfare. We were living in the projects, mm. um, government subsidized housing. Uh, I was working seven days a week and just still wasn't making enough money. Right. Uh, because of like, even though I was skilled tradesman um, with the auto mechanics, I chose not to work in the industry just because of all the sexism I was getting. And so I was happier making the $10,000 a year working for myself than it was for anyone else. Right. Um, and I didn't have any, I didn't have a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of, but I knew darn well that I had to go and be a welder. Uh, I went to BOCES, which is um, adult education. Uh, which is where I learned on mechanics was in high school through so the BOCES program. I love it. So nice. Much. That's great. Um, but they told me it was $1,200 uh, to take the welding course. You get a six month course and it's enough to, you know, get you started. And so I went back home and said, I am going to learn how to weld. I'm going to pay $1,200. And my husband voted no. <laughs> um, <laughs> and because I was the one making the money, I made a defiant decision. And I said, this is what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. um, it took me nine months to work and save up for the $1,200. Um, November 2007, I started BOCES for welding. And um, I got to, like, I already knew I was in love with it before I started. Like, it doesn't make sense. Um, but I just, I knew it was for me. It just was one of those things that, I've never been hit like that before in my life as far as just like, yeah, this is, you know. Like I knew I wanted to be an auto mechanic. I was in love with auto mechanics and I went after it. But I mean, there was not, I mean, like this is literally like being struck by lightning. Like this is what you have to do. I knew I needed the weld and make art. Like I knew I needed to breathe. Wow. So you started taking this training program and you were with other adults who were learning right alongside you. Yep. And were you- There was 12 of us in the class, give or take. Were you the only woman by any chance? I yeah, won. you are. Okay. By all chance. <laughs> by any chance? Huh? <laughs> and how long was that program? It was a six month program over the course of 104 hours, twice a week um, for half a year. So March, I think I graduated in March ish, somewhere around in there. Wow. And then did that lead you to a job where you were using those skills? 
Yeah, what was it? What was that job? Um, I got hired as a sheet metal worker. I did custom fabrication at a local shop called Cameron Manufacturing and Design, who I was so scared to work for because of all the sexism I dealt with in auto mechanics. And I got into Cameron um, and they were magnificent to me. It was oh, just night great. and day. Uh, there was a woman that was working there as a welder. She's magnificent, Cheryl Garton. Um, she actually trained me in TIG welding and taught me just insane TIG skills. It took me a long time to get it. She's a very patient woman. I'm so grateful for her. But um, just really took her time and, you know, was as patient as she possibly could be. But, uh, yeah, taught me all kinds of TIG welding skills, which is like everyone kept telling me, like, TIG is where the money's at. TIG is where the money's at. And I just want to learn welding in general. Mm -hmm. Because my ultimate goal is to get good enough in the welding and the fabrication because welding and fabrication are two different animals. So just because you can weld and you can lay a good bead doesn't mean that you can fabricate and create and make. So I needed both. And so I got in there and I just was the best student I could possibly be and just practiced and asked a ton of questions. I'm so sorry for asking all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, you were lucky you found a great mentor. And, um, but did you kind of know that was just a, just a stop, just a stepping stone along the way? Yeah. Before I took the job, I knew that I would quit the job and go full time as an artist. Now, I didn't tell them at that, at the interview. <laughs> yes, that was smart. But, um, yeah, that was, that was a stepping stone for me. Uh, I stayed there for five years. Um, most magnificent five years. These guys are still my brothers. Um, still nice. talk to them. And I actually go there and that's where I buy my material from. They're a fantastic, fantastic company. Um, they have very, very high standards of work. And so very frustrating for me at first because it just, it took me a long time to be able to learn to work up to the level that they expected. But I was deeply blessed with that company because they made me work to a very high standard and hold a high standard. Mm -hmm. um, that's in everything I do today. It's in everything I do. So just, absolutely deeply grateful that they took a chance on me because I did, I only had 104 hours of welding experience. When I took my test, uh, my welding test to get in, they saw I was teachable and they saw I had passion and I got hired on that, not on my skills. I think that's an important point, you know, and it, and it applies to people in, in any job. Say it again, they, they hired you because of what? Because I was, I was willing to learn and I was passionate about what I was doing. I was teachable. Um, I deeply don't believe in applications. If I ever hire someone for my shop, I would tell them, this is what I need, go to work. I don't care what you put on paper because I really, like, I have my journeyman in iron plate and sheet metal. It's, it's an honor as a welder to hold that title, to hold that certificate. Mm -hmm. But I've met a lot of people that have um, certifications and they were taught to pass tests and okay. problem solving set there. And so certifications are great and I honor that, oh, but there's a difference between holding certifications and being able to do the job. Right. So I, I totally would put someone to work in my shop. And I would see you know, if the passion is there and if the teachability, are you willing to take corrective criticism? That's a huge one. Yeah, absolutely. Are you coachable? Yes. So, um, so you're there at this company for five years and did you start doing your own thing on the side? Uh, yes. After three and a half years of working there, um, I was able to fix my credit. So That's a big deal. Yes. I bought a house for this garage right you here. You bought a house. I bought a house. I fixed my credit. I bought the house for the garage. Um, and then I saved up again. It took me about another 10 months to save up for um, a welder and a plasma cutter for the house. And I started bringing my welding helmet home. I'm just like looking around. Um, brought my welding helmet home and started working nights and weekends after work. And I did that for about uh, just about a year uh, working both jobs. Wow. And you know what? I love that you were kind of, you were kind of, you were building up um, a more permanent life for yourself. I mean, you didn't rent, you bought. Yes. You started collecting the equipment that you needed. You made sure you got the training and you asked the questions and you developed these long-term friendships. I mean, you were building that foundation. That's really cool. It's neat.
So what was the first thing that you messed around with at home that you made outside that, that shop at work? This is such a weird thing. So I'm like such a redneck. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm tailgates and Coors Light kind of girl. And weirdly, I don't know where the hell it came from. I just get inspired to make stuff. And I'm like, okay, go. Um, the first thing I made was a three tier chandelier. A three tier <laughs> chandelier. Yeah, I, like I, I've been to clean a more trailer parks than I wish to admit. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'm not even sure where it came from, but I just had this idea for a three tier chandelier. It took me 40 hours to create. I hand cut um, panes. I, I'm going to call it panes. Um, pieces of steel, like uh, just pieces, and then just chain and all the way around it, and it was square. So it went from 18 inches square. Uh, down, I don't even remember how small the inside of it was, maybe like eight inches by eight inches, but like a large one, smaller one, a smaller one, had one light bulb in it. I wired it myself. Um, uh, I hung it actually from the little hook that's here in the ceiling. I took pictures of it and then I cried like a little girl because I was scared to post it on social media. Um, it's one thing making stuff in a shop when they hand you a blueprint and they hand you the parts and they say, here, weld it. Mm -hmm. Um, that chandelier was the first thing. I mean, like that journey from that moment of making that, I'm doing math on how long it took me. I think close to five years. Five years from the moment I had the idea and the, the, you know, the notion I'm going to be a sculptor. About five years it took me once I saved up and went to school and did the education, um, worked at that shop. Um, about five years it took me to do that. I knew that that was my path. But to take that from an idea to a tangible object, to see it there and know like this is 100% me. Yeah. And I said to myself that I could do it and then I did it. It scares the living sh out of me. <laughs> yeah, that's a... Uh, oh. It just, it was um, to put that out there, like to have this dream and then to put it out there forever to see. I've never felt more naked in my entire life. Um, it took me 24 hours to post it on social media. Well, good for you. I mean, it did it, and did it get better? Did it get easier to post after that first, that first oh, one? And now I can't yeah. even wait to post stuff. Um, when I posted that, I did get amazing feedback from people. Um, my problem is it's because of the high standards. I look at stuff and I just, I'll tear it apart in my head. And so where everyone else is like, Oh God, Barbie, that's beautiful. I'm just like thinking, okay, I could have cleaned that up. That could have been better. That could be different. And so I'm always, you know, and, and it's a really a blessing because that's how I've gotten to work with the companies I've worked with and the people yeah. I've worked with because my standards are so high. They know that they're going to get something that like I'm not done until they're in love with that. Yeah. Wow. Yep. I know all about that perfectionism, <laughs> but it is really important for what you're doing. So what became of that chandelier? Do you uh, still have it? I owned it for a year and a half. <laughs> And then you sold it? Uh, it hung in my laundry room for a year and a half. And then um, I did one of my very first um, shows where I go and I set up, a, I say a booth, I set up a table and put my art on it and tried to sell it. And this woman came up, it was a very slow, cold day. Um, this woman came up and fell in love and like freaked out. And she's like, I've got to call my husband. Um, He's sick. He's home with a sick kid, but he needs to come here and see this right now. Um, she freaked out. I was like, okay. Um, I had like a couple of tables there. I had a lamp I had made. I had probably about 20 pieces at that time that I'd made because I was making all kinds of stuff, but I wasn't selling it because I had no clue how to sell. I just knew I could make it. Um, he came down and between the two of them, they cut me, I think about a $600 check, uh, bought a ton of stuff. They had a local store nice. um, in Geneva, New York. And I wish I knew the name of that store. Very, uh, very eclectic store. And the stuff I was making is literally um, right up their alley. And they took my stuff, doubled the prices and sold it in their store. And I was just like, hell yeah. Oh, um, awesome. Sent her a picture. Of, uh, she wanted to see the chandelier. They ended up buying the chandelier and a couple of other pieces, including my my first table I ever made a uh, spider web table that I just would like to buy back from them if they haven't sold it yet, because I love it so much. <laughs> that's, oh, that's wow. I, it's 
like I've had to sell all these pieces that I'm just like, I love so much. Like to have it, like I'm like, I wonder if they sold that. Like I could go visit the store and like, I'm in a position now where I can start buying stuff back. Yeah, you need to go check it out. And uh, then, I do, then like, I do. I know yeah. It yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So was there a certain point in this whole journey where you felt like, this is it, I'm going to make it like it's, this is really going to work out? Um, yeah. When I made the sculptures for Harley Davidson, mm. that right there was a massive turning point. I have like, I'm all giggly and I'm all happy. And I've told you all the people that I've worked for and stuff, but there was three and a half years of fear and depression that I worked through in order to get where I am today. Um, when, when I was contacted to do the two sculptures for Harley Davidson, um, you know what? I don't even know if that was still like, that there's just, there's just been so much like, I guess it's hard to explain. Like I have these, like make that one, that sculpture. And it's like, my head is down. Like, okay, done next, done next, done next, done next. And I really haven't taken too much time to lift my head up and look around and see where I've gotten to. Um, September was year five for me being full time. I think last summer, which is actually about a year, almost a full year after the Harley Davidson sculptures. Um, last year is where I got, I started getting comfortable, where, where I was like, this is it. Like, I am, it's when I started telling people no. Um, yeah. Until that point, with all due respect, um, if someone had a trailer step that needed to be fixed, I welded it. If they had something that needed to be fixed, I welded it. Um, just out of fear, I took every single job that came my way. And my mm -hmm. prices were really low because I was scared that if I priced too high, then I wouldn't sell it. I wouldn't be able to pay my nice egg bill. Um, I've got two boys and no insurance, and I've got to pay bills. You know, it's like they like to eat food, man. <laughs> my older boy is like paying for himself and is, you know, old enough to pay his own bills and everything else. But at the time of quitting my job, my son was, t my, my youngest son was 10, mm. nine or 10. Um, and so, I mean, like it was ridiculous. My dad, like my mom and dad cried. They're like, what are you doing? Cause I had stability for the first time in my life. Like I had foundation, um, I had two boats, uh, one for the lake and one for the pond. Cause I love to fish. Um, I bought my son a four wheeler. Uh, I had a brand new motorcycle. I've never had anything new in my life. I literally have been low income all my life. Um, single mom, almost all my life. Um, and my choice is like totally my choice is like no one else is like totally me. Right. But for the first time, I really had like this, you know, I had, you know, I was able to provide for my sons in a way that I've always wanted to and never been able to. Um, walking away was scary as crap because it was like walking away from all that freedom, but I knew in my heart, that's what I had to do. Right. And probably last year, like a little bit before five years is where I really hit that. Um, yeah. Like this is like, this is going to be okay, but I haven't slowed down because there's still that, like, I can lose this in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. I've worked so hard for this. Um, I'm traveling. Like I've always wanted to travel I'm picking and choosing the sculptures that I want to make. Um, I'm pricing them where I want to price them and I'm not like scared. And it's like, you know what? You don't want it. You know, that's good. Like this is my price. And you know, I'm, I'm not negotiating prices anymore. Um, and I'm deeply honored to be where I am, like deeply grateful and honored to be where I am. Never been happier in my entire life. Like my entire life is like absolutely perfect. And I can't imagine a more perfect life. And just when I say that I have opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, it's mm. so real. It's oh, really that's, that's so wonderful to hear. Um, how did Harley Davidson find you and what did you create for them? So this is super fun. Um, Instagram and social media has just been an amazing, amazing, amazing platform for me. Um, Social media is how I've succeeded as an artist is by getting my stuff out. I've had to learn how to do it. Um, I was on Instagram one day and I was having breakfast and I'm just scrolling through um, like new followers and what people have said. I respond to every single person that writes me on social media, even though it takes me a little bit longer now. Wow. Um, it's deeply important for me to respect the people who take their time. They deserve my time as well. So that's something like that's number one. 
And as I'm going through there, I see that Jesse James Dupree is following me. Um, Jesse James Dupree is a lead singer for Jackal. I have been a Jackal fan since I can't remember when. And I am just like, are you kidding me? Like, Jesse James Dupree has <laughs> followed me on Instagram. And so, like, I start looking through his stuff and realize that he's got his own brand of whiskey, um, Jesse James Bourbon. And I am just like, holy crap, like, I want to brand stuff as well. And that's something I've worked on is my brand. Um, and I've branded some stuff here and there, but, you know, I want next level stuff because I'm always like, what's next? What's next? And wow. I see that he's branded his own whiskey. And I'm just like, I'm a humbug. I'm like, he's following me. So he knows I exist. I'm like, I'm just going to reach out to him and ask him how he branded the whiskey. Worst case scenario, I've never talked to him before. I'm not, you know, I have everything to gain and nothing to lose. Right. And so I reached out to him. I sent him a message. And I'm sitting in this little diner having breakfast and he sends me a message back. He's like, what's your number? I'm going to call you. Oh, wow. <laughs> Are you shitting me? Like, you got to be <laughs> kidding me. It's just crazy, right? Uh, I go out to my truck, pay the bill, go out to my truck. And I sat there and he called me up. He spent 15 minutes on the phone with me and explained to me what he did and how he was branding himself. And I cannot even begin to tell you how grateful I am. This man took his time. This is like, like, I can't even, oh, what the hell? <laughs> you know, it's crazy. And so like, we, you know, like, you know, that was an amazing it's moment. Our, yeah. our, anything can happen. So right. he actually reached out to me two weeks later and he says, Barbie, he's uh, been hired by Harley Davidson. Um, they want me to promote them uh, during Sturgis. Jesse owns Pappy Hoyle Campground. It's right next to Full Throttle Saloon. Uh, Jesse and Michael Ballard own the property together or co-own it. And they've got Harley Davidson out there. He's like, I'm going to hire you to make a sculpture for Harley Davidson for HOG, H-O-G. It's Harley Owners Group. I want you to weld it live at Sturgis at the Pappy Hoyle Campground. And then I'm also going to have you weld a sculpture for Harley Davidson for their 115th anniversary. Ready, go. And he really just gave me the creative freedom that I need to um, just thrive. Um, yeah. He gave me this creative freedom, like, give me a direction, let me know what you, know, what you want. Um, so I took my truck, my welder, a couple of grinders, a table, and a tent, and all my art. Uh, drove 24 hours out to Sturgis um, by myself, because I'm that person. <laughs> Um, cause I make, I make stuff happen. Um, yes, you do. I, I have never made, I, I've welded live. I actually started a little live welding show where I travel. I was traveling up and down the East coast, um, from Vermont to Georgia. I was setting up and I was welding live at shows and I just kind of BS my way into that one. That's a story for another day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, so I mean like I've welded live before, but I've welded simple projects live. I've only done a couple pieces that were like true masterpiece sculptures. Um, I did one in Vermont that was a, a duck I, I created. Um, but nothing of like this caliber live. And so I'm just like, yeah, I'll do it. And I say yes to people and I figure it out later. Um, that's how I wrote my first book is like, hey, can you write a book? I'm like, yeah, I can. I thought it was a joke. Well, apparently it wasn't. And so I had to figure out how to do it. But I just, I say yes and I just, you know, I learned. Um, I worked seven days on the masterpiece sculpture for Hog, um, wow. live out in like the open under. I had a tent, but um, like day two, like an 80 mile per hour wind comes through. And like, you wow. Know, I'm just like, yeah, I'm not used to out west. I'm used to East Coast. So I'm just like, you know, like me and 30 people are like running all my art into like this. Oh my gosh, it was crazy. Um, I finished that sculpture two hours before it was supposed to be on stage. Um, he did tell me he was going to present it to Harley Davidson. So I'm like, this is awesome. Um, did not know, but he gives me a backstage pass and I get to hang out backstage during the concert. So I'm up on the stage at Full Throttle Saloon. I'm rocking out and I'm listening to Jackal and I'm just like, this is like the best, you know, best day of my life. And I've got my cell phone. I hear him start doing the announcement. I'm like, I start pulling my cell phone out of my boot. And I go to record it so my mom and dad can see it. And he calls me out on stage. Oh, uh, that's, that's really cool. Thousands of people and has me 
present the sculpture to Harley Davidson. Just incredible. And now, you know, just mind blowing. And because he's got his bourbon, he's up on stage and like, you know, me and Harley Davidson guys and Jesse, we're all passing the bottle back and forth and I take a big swig and they're all taking, the only picture of that entire thing is a fan that recognized me from the audience, took a picture of me, and I happen to have the bottle like this. Oh, lovely. Yeah, Dear lovely. Mom Dad, <laughs> Dear mom and Dad, you're going to be so proud of your little girl. Here I am on stage drinking. Um, so that opened, and then that opened up a whole other world to you. It wow. Really wow, that's, that's, that's incredible. That's incredible. Two weeks later, made the 115th anniversary sculpture for Harley Davidson here in my shop. And then drove that one out to Milwaukee and uh, got to go up on stage again. I had a photographer for that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was smart. That was smart. I got smart on the second one. I always do. You, what do your kids think about what you're doing? Um, I'm just mom. I think to them, my my oldest boy is like like both my kids are very proud of me. My oldest boy, who is 26, um, he's watched and he's been with me. You know, single mom. I was 17 when I had him. Um, he's watched the whole journey from, from the welfare to the world renowned sculptor. He's deeply proud of me. Um, he's super supportive. And there's actually a point where I was failing so magnificently that he actually moved back home to help me pay my mortgage so I wouldn't have to go back to work so I could continue being an artist. Uh, so yeah. um, I couldn't be prouder of my kids. I'm like, try to be the parent they deserve every day. It's, mm -hmm. it's you know, it's like, they are amazing. They are deeply supportive, but you know, it's just kind of like, yeah, it's just mom, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Did they, and are they interested in welding? Um, not really. My, my youngest boy, when he was five, I taught him to TIG weld and he welded with me on and off. Um, like when I started, like he did it a couple of times, once when he was five, once when he was six. At the company picnic, I snuck him in the shop. <laughs> um, but when I started in the shop here at the house, um, he was welding with me every Wednesday. We'd have workshop Wednesday, and I would set up a project for him. Oh, and uh. if his grades were good, then he could come in and he could make art. And he was actually selling it at shows. Um, he got to the point where he was creating his own stuff. And the last year I did shows that he was welding, I think he was, gosh, 12. I don't even know. Don't ask me on the, the, the years and this stuff. I think he was 12. He paid 400 bucks uh, at shows selling his art. So, but uh, he that's got incredible. That, went into bladesmithing, did bladesmithing for a year, made a Damascus knife, quit bladesmithing, and now he likes to cook. And that's my favorite out of all. Oh, good. Yeah. You buy the ingredients and he cooks them up. I think that's, that's perfect. Right. He's a much better cook than I ever thought about him being. <laughs> that is perfect. I love that. Okay. Fantastic. So where do you see your business going? I know you're sort of following the journey and things are unfolding, but do you have a do you have a vision in mind? Um definitely. My big moves I got planned for this year, and I just again like I just try to figure stuff out. Um I'm working on creating a TV show that I want to showcase metal art and welders um, in the welding industry. The welding industry just changed my life and has blessed me so deeply. And so I want to do everything in my power to give back, but I also want to show people that welding is, you know, can be art. Um, so I'm working on doing that. I'm just at the very beginning stages of that. Nice. Um, I would like to create a line of blue collar action figures like women action figures so that young girls have different role models growing up that they can have you know like they can look up to a welder they can look up to an auto mechanic or a, a contractor or a plumber or a race car driver that are love it friends. yes so like that's like i'm working on kind of stuff like that the sculpture is going to uh, this i've gone from smaller pieces i'm working on doing public art um i have i think three three public sculptures now and my direction is I want to do the larger the public pieces like this um, and I want to buy a bigger shop I'm still in a one car garage it is 12 foot by 26 foot mm. it is the entire space I'm working in all the things that I've done is in this little space 
Um, I wanted a bigger shop for as long as I could remember. Um, this year it might happen, but the foundation is deeply important to me. Um, mm -hmm. I'm financially in a very good point in my life now, and passive income has been the answer for that through the books, through the YouTube channel, through, uh, through sponsorships from companies. Um, I've got passive income, and that's allowed me to, you know, I, I can pour, you know, hundreds of hours into her, and I'm not scared anymore, like, oh, my God, will I pay my bills this month? But um, these, these big pieces like this is what I really want to do so that, you know, like, like in hotels and in, you know, in public areas so that more people can see them, like doing the smaller pieces. It's, uh, you know, like you buy it, you put it in your home and it goes on a shelf and you love it. And the 10 people that come and visit, you love it. Right. It disappears from the world. So like the ones that are, yeah, that's my, that's my thing. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I think Tom Hanks should put your sculptures in one of his next movies, one of his that upcoming movies. That would be awesome. Movies. I've actually had a client get a hold of me, I think, two years ago. And uh, it's really weird. I am literally like two ships passing the night with Tom Hanks. Wow. Um, I had a um, client get a hold of me two years ago and asked me to make uh, the Angels and Demons sculpture from that movie. And I think it ended up being... 18 inches tall 18 or 20 inches tall give or take but i, I actually made the sculpture that is featured in that movie i mean like my sculpture is not in the movie but i made the sculpture that was in the movie like i made my version of it oh that's I'm so cool that right i did not make the sculpture for the movie yeah that's okay yeah yet you will i know right i totally feel like that'd be amazing right yeah that would be really neat well this is so cool okay so my final question to you is it's not really my final question, actually. Um, <laughs> so if someone is thinking about quitting their job, their their regular paycheck to do something that they've been thinking about, they feel like it's a calling, what would you say to them? What's your advice? Absolutely do it. But you need to prepare. You need to plan and you really need to just think deeply into the planning part the planning is huge so i thought i knew how much it was going to cost i over exaggerated how easy it was going to be um and i did not know how much money it was going to cost um i based it on me i was just like i really i had no right to quit my job i had saved up some money and everything else but the financial aspect of it the better position you can put yourself in financially, the less stress you're going to have. I mean, yeah. obviously you still, it's, it takes work. Um, I think that if your heart says that you need to go and do something, like your happiness is number one. And I think that you have to do it. Yeah. But the more you plan and the more you think out, you know, Think about every like every worst case scenario and then plan for that. And then if it doesn't happen, then yay. And if it does, then you're already prepared. But definitely think long game. Um, I don't know what I was thinking really. And like, again, I'm so grateful for everything I've gone through. Um, I've, I, I've taken, and I, here's another thing I'm gonna deeply suggest is be able to look at yourself non-judgmentally and mm -hmm. if there's an area you're weak in, work on that. So for myself, um, I sucked at selling. I had no idea that I would have to sell, brand, or market a business. I mean, I was deeply ignorant. Um, today, you can go on YouTube and you can learn all these things. And if you're going, right. like every business sells, no matter what you're doing, you have to sell in order you know, to survive. Whether it's selling yourself through social media or selling a product or selling an idea, whatever it is. Um, if you can study sales or if you have a sales background, it's just going to deeply help you. But mm. really, truly think about like You're going to have to sell. You're going to have to brand. You're going to have to market. Um, where is your client? And everyone's like, oh, who's your best client? It took me three and a half, four, three and a half to four years before I actually understood who my client really was and then how to find them. Um, and I heard it for, I actually had joined entrepreneur group and people were like, oh, you need to know who your client is. I'm like, I know I won't buy my art. 
you know, like, yeah. I don't really know, you know, I know now, I know today, and, you know, and it's made my job so much easier, but in the beginning, I just didn't understand that. Um, find people who are like you, whether it's on social media or um, local entrepreneur groups, find podcasts like this and videos that is yeah. going to help you. Um, if you can't physically be around people that are thinking like you, like no one that I know in the beginning, um, no one believed in me. No one got what I was doing. Just there was no one. I had no support team. I supported myself. I believed in myself. And you might be in the same position. Go out and find people that will champion you because it will just help you so much. Whether it's, you know, wherever you find them, just please go find a support group. Like, you need that. Um, right. Local entrepreneur groups are really huge, too. But definitely, man, if it makes your heart happy, if you feel like that's what you have to do, you go for it. Even if you fail magnificently, at least you tried and that puts you ahead of everybody. And the thing is, you don't fail until you really give up. So you could do like 10 times and you still didn't fail if you're still trying. You know, like it, it took me, it took me four and a half years to get really comfortable and not be working out of fear and be working back. Like I've worked out of love, like on and off, but it did, it took four and a half years. So be prepared for the long game just tell yourself it's not a matter of if that I'm successful. It's just a matter of when and just keep at it. That's awesome. Thank you so much. So my truly <laughs> last question is, so when we've already sort of said this, but just to, just to recap, where can people find you? If they want to learn more about you. They want to see your art. Where should they, where should they go? Uh, my website, barbiethewelder.com is the best place to go and see my art. I have a couple of available sculptures on there. Um, you can see my videos. I love to share my process. It was such a hard challenge for me to learn how to weld art. So now that I know more, I share, as soon as I learn something, I share it. So my videos on YouTube, oh, nice. um, share step by step how, like if there's stuff that you want to make, um, like the Harley Davidson sculpture, you guys can go over and check out how I made the Harley Davidson sculpture that is step by step on there, along with the presentation, which I caught in the second one. Um, seeing how it's made is just really fun for me. And I love that. So I share that with that. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and now TikTok uh, at Barbie the Welder. So that's come, perfect. Shenanigans. That's always fun. Perfect. Perfect. That's wonderful. Well, I wish you great continued success. I can't wait to see the final masterpiece, see how she comes out. Um, oh, I don't think I can afford her. At Go ahead. One more thing, you can find me, check this out, this is crazy. It's Art Anything Can Happen, um, live on the Today Show on the 19th of February. I'm gonna be on the Today Show. The 19th of February, okay, well, I definitely have to publish this podcast before then on the I Today know, Show. Right? This is just like are they coming to you or are you going to them? How does that work? I'm going to them and I'll be there with a couple other ladies and I can't tell you more than that, but it is going to be magnificent. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, congratulations. Yes. Well, I was going to say I can't afford your half million dollar masterpiece behind you, but I know that it will go to a beautiful home someplace. Somebody will take good care of it. Um, and then at some point down the road, I will be able to afford your half million dollar masterpiece. So yeah, there that'll be good. Go. Hey, we'll do business together. We get closer yes. and closer one day at a time. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, Barbie. Thank you so much. And I will talk to you soon. Awesome. I am honored. Thank you so very much for your time. Thank you.